One of the things I like to do in my spare time is to make lists of things. Um, albums by a particular artist, movies by a particular director, books by a particular author. I'll make lists and then I will rank them. And I was making such a list recently about Stephen King's books from the 1980s. And I enjoyed the endeavor so much and it occurred to me, there's your next video. So today I'm going to do a ranking video where I rank all 18 major works that Stephen King published between 1980 and 1989. I think they were actually 20 in this period, but I'm not going to include the Bachman books omnibus. I'm going to consider the standalone Bachman book releases, and I'm also not including My Pretty Pony, which was sort of almost a limited edition in only 15,000 copies and is a single short story stretched to um, fill an entire book. So I will not be including Bachman books, The Omnibus, and My Pretty Pony, but I will be including all, all 18 other titles. So I know that these things are divisive and you might think I'm crazy, but I have read all of these books and after careful consideration, here's how I rate what is probably Stephen King's most productive, prolific, and fertile period of his entire career. Coming in at number 18 at the bottom of the list, Stephen King writing as Richard Bachman, Roadwork. I just did this one in the last couple of years and I found it to be kind of a slog. The main character is not very likable. He's angry, he's bitter, and the book just didn't grab and hold my attention. I'm glad I read it, I did finish it, but it's definitely, it's my least favorite from the 80s, it's my least favorite from the entire um, sort of brief catalog of Richard Bachman titles. Next, coming in at number 17, next to the bottom, I have to put Cycle of the Werewolf. Now this might not really be a fair title for inclusion, but it is its own book. Um, what I can say in defense of Cycle of the Werewolf, it's my very favorite short novel that was originally intended to be published in a calendar. It's my very favorite story about a werewolf originally intended to be published in a calendar. Um, the artwork is excellent. The story is fine, um, fairly predictable. I think, I, I appreciate that Stephen King has never shied away from um, sort of a interesting writing structure challenge, uh, such as the serial publication of The Green Mile, for instance, but I just think that the artificiality of trying to shoehorn the story into 12 segments um, for the calendar concept uh, just doesn't do Cycle many favors. So for that reason, it is my number 17. Now, number 16. Um, while I do love the Dark Tower series as an entire experience, uh, one that I, I haven't read for several years, I, I do intend to go back to the Tower at some point and do the entire series again. Um, the series didn't really take off with me until the second book, and I knew that going in. I had already heard and read that you make it through Gunslinger and then things really pick up in Drawing of the Three. And that was my experience. I, um, I know that the Gunslinger was originally published um, in individual segments across many years and as such it's a little bit disjointed 
um, but still I found it to be um, a fairly dry and unengaging and for that reason the gunslinger number 16 third from the bottom I wouldn't I can't, I can't live without it the Dark Tower series wouldn't exist without it so I'm definitely glad that it's a thing but if I'm being honest um, even when I reread the series I will be looking forward to getting through Gunslinger to get to the second book number 15 so I know that this is some people's very very favorite Stephen King book of all time but I read it when I was a kid um, maybe 12 or 13 years old and I really really liked it at that time I attempted to read it again or do it again um, in the last year and I got about halfway through and I had to stop and that is Christine um, I just for some reason it just wasn't resonating for me in the same way as it did in my first reading and then um, about halfway through it completely changes um, narr narrative uh, perspective goes from first person to third person and for some reason I know that sounds really snobby and pretentious which is absolutely what you shouldn't sound like when you're trying to review um, Stephen King but I just it was jarring to me and I already was having a hard time um, getting into the story caring about the characters and so I I did not finish it in my second read through but um, so yeah number 15 I'm almost sorry to say it because I did enjoy it so much the first time but as of right now where I'm at in my life this is my fourth from the bottom for the 80s and rounding out the bottom five the top of the bottom five number 14 I'm gonna put Richard Bachman's breakthrough novel and the novel that actually was the death of Richard Bachman uh, thinner I did enjoy um, its kind of grungy it's um, a little dark and twisted and kind of mean-spirited and I did enjoy it um, but it certainly didn't come across as like top tier uh, Stephen King to me and I, I think in some ways the story about how it came to be and how it came to be the final Richard Bachman book is almost more interesting than the novel itself so this is this process is entirely subjective of course but um, so I put thinner solidly a B-list Stephen King novel and as such it ends up toward the bottom of my list from the 80s so at number 13 there's another one there's probably every single Stephen King work has somebody or some group of people who would say this is my absolute favorite thing that he ever did and of all the novels that the majority of people seem to love and I just couldn't get into I couldn't get lost in the magic of the world and I felt really bad about it I wanted to love this book but I just couldn't number 13 the talisman it has some brilliant brilliant set pieces the ending the black hotel I thought was brilliant the sunlight home that whole segment was torturous slow burn build up of tension absolutely brilliant payoff um, but other parts of it I know that Jack has to go on this mission but sometimes when 
the novel just carries you away and just pulls you into a world, you almost forget that the author is sort of God on high, manipulating characters, moving pieces around to make the story go. And in The Talisman, I was always aware of the two gods on high looking down, moving the characters around, or stopping their progress for another lengthy diversion um, in some new horrible place. And I found that aspect of it kind of frustrating. Um, I know that they wrote some of the book together, they traded sections off, and you can kind of see where the seams are. I feel like, you know, one one author takes them a little bit farther down the road, stops, there's a bunch of business at some place, and then they resolve that and they move on. And then that's where the other author picks up and they're on the road, they stop again, some more business, and then they move on again. Um, I just, I didn't care for Talisman. I adored the heck out of Black House, the sequel. So I do want to go back and reread both at some point in the future and see if my experience with Black House doesn't influence or color a reread of Talisman. This one does make me sad because I had such high hopes, but number 13, The Talisman. Number 12 of 18 in the 80s. For me, the last book of the 80s, The Dark Half. There's a lot about this that I really like. I find it entertaining in kind of a sick way. It's an interesting, almost um, autobiographical look at Stephen King's relationship with his pseudonym, his pen name, Richard Bachman. Um, as with a lot of books in the 80s, there's some interesting autobiographical elements if you look for them about drug addiction and creativity and, and all of the above. Um, I consider it solid B-level Stephen King. I, I wouldn't consider it um, an all-time classic. It's a, a decent book. It's, it's a, a decent read. Um, sort of the, the plot rests on this idea that a pseudonym comes to life and starts killing people. I mean, spoiler alert, but that's, you know, that's, I think, on the back jacket flap. Um, so you have to suspend disbelief quite a bit to believe that a pseudonym can come to life and start killing people. But once you accept that premise, the book really moves along and it is entertaining, but um, it doesn't crack my, my top half of the 80s. It is um, number 12. And right around the same time, coming in at number 11, I have the coke-fueled alien sci-fi horror epic, The Tommyknockers. Um, the, about the first third of the book, I didn't care for very much at all. I, I felt like it was long-winded, the characters were obnoxious, um, they were verbose, and but it does really settle down and sort of get down to brass tacks. And I, I found it um, really interesting in the second and the middle part and then the last part of the book, I thought were um, pretty solid. Uh, Stephen King's idea, his concept of the alien race and the spaceship and all of that I, I thought was really interesting and he had some he had some interesting things to say even though his brain was seemingly um, fried uh, on cocaine the whole time that he was the whole time that he was writing it um, but it is at the top of the bottom half of the 80s, solid B-level Stephen King, um, but yeah, the Tommyknockers. So above Tommyknockers, I put um, The Running Man, which of course uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is nothing like 
the actual character in the book, which is comical. I understand why they would want him to be in a movie version. I like the movie version as well, even though it's kind of a terrible adaptation of the novel. Um, it's cheesy, it's campy, and in a lot of ways, the novel is too. I think The Running Man was the one that Stephen King wrote in like three days or four days, just finished the entire freaking book in over a holiday um, where he was off of school, where he, he was teaching. And the, the manic energy and the anger and the anarchy and, and everything, Stephen King doesn't give himself time to think, doesn't give himself time to second guess or question anything. It just barrels along. And I thoroughly enjoyed this book. It's no, it's not a classic. It's not top shelf Stephen King, but it is um, thoroughly enjoyable and definitely one of my favorites of all of the Bachman books. It's, it's a quick read, it's energetic, it's angry, and I highly recommend it. So, that is the bottom half of my list. Nine books down, nine books to go. And coming in at number nine, I have The Eyes of the Dragon. Now, I liked The Eyes of the Dragon. I wasn't expecting to like The Eyes of the Dragon, but I did like it. Um, it is, it's its own thing in its own world. It's the book that Stephen King wrote um, for his daughter when she complained as a teenager that he never wrote anything that she would be interested in reading. Um, so in that regard, it's it's sweet and it it has some distinctly adult elements, but it's the closest, I think, that Stephen King has come to writing YA. It's in some ways a YA novel that is written for mature teenagers. It doesn't speak down to its audience. I, I liked it. To me, it sort of sticks out. It's its own thing and, and doesn't fit smoothly in the overall canon of what I consider classic Stephen King works. I'm, I'm glad he wrote it. I, I think it shows a diversity and a breadth of his talent that, um, like I said, I wasn't expecting to enjoy this, but I did. I, I really like Eyes of the Dragon. It's not my favorite. Um, it would be an interesting starting point for an adventurous young person who's into fantasy, um, dragons, swords, swords and sorcery, all of that stuff. And, um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot going for it. Not the least of which is an absolutely beautiful trade hardcover edition. Um, one of the nicest trade hardcovers in the Stephen King catalog and, um, definitely a beautiful looking book. So that is number nine. Number eight, I debated about whether or not to include collections. Um, sometimes people rate the novels, they rate the collections separately, but I was just going for books. Um, novel length books, whether or not they contain one story, four stories, or two dozen stories. And so in that, in that regard, in that sense, for that reason, at number eight, I put the collection Skeleton Crew. This is a classic Stephen King collection, and it includes one of his best overall works. Um, some could call it a novella. Uh, it has been released as a standalone um, title, almost short novel length. I'm talking about The Mist. So even if Skeleton Crew only contained the mist, it would be a contender 
um, for the top 50% of Stephen King's 1980s output. But Skeleton Crew doesn't stop with The Mist, not by far. It includes multiple other stories, some of which um, it also includes poetry. It's a very diverse collection, but some of the stories uh, rank among Stephen King's best and the ones that I didn't particularly care for, and there are a few. Um, the beauty of short stories is you spend a little bit of time with it. If it doesn't resonate, you move on. It's no big deal. But the value of this book is pretty mind-boggling when you consider all the content that's in there. And as such, regardless, novels, collections, regardless, what, what have you, it definitely, to me, ranks in the top, um, the top 50% of Stephen King's 80s output. And comes in at number eight. So I'm entering territory now. The 80s is the, maybe not like the ultra iconic heart of Stephen King's classic period, but it is definitely a vital classic part of Stephen King's classic period. And I'm getting into territory where every single book is iconic, every single book almost um, is well known to the general public. There were movies based on these books. They're very famous and everybody, there's somebody out there who would consider any of these books like the best thing that Stephen King ever wrote. So this is a challenging prospect to finish out this list and to rank these books because they're all excellent and they're all classic in their own way. But in some ways, the more challenging the process of ranking is, the more I enjoy it. So I did, I thought about this a lot, but coming in at number seven, so finishing out the, the top seven of the 80s, or starting out the top seven of the 80s, I have Firestarter. This, um, to me, it suffers a bit from the split in tone. The first part um, where, where Andy and Charlie are on the run is its, its own thing. And, you know, it's suspenseful. And then about halfway, about halfway through, the momentum comes to a screeching halt, or it did to me when I was reading the book for the first time. And then it finds its voice again. And the part of the book that takes place in the shop is also excellent, but it was kind of jarring. And what I thought the goal of the book was, which was for them to elude capture, um, it was very disappointing and very sad and very upsetting when halfway through they, they are captured. Again, major spoiler alert, so sorry for that, but I would imagine most people watching this are very familiar with the story of this book. So to me, it struggles a bit in that regard. It feels like like two, no, two related novellas inside of one book. Um, but like I said, it finds its way again. The shop segment is turns out to be really good. Um, scary, thought-provoking, and then um, it struggles a bit, as a lot of Stephen King books do, with the ending. I found the ending to be very abrupt. I, it, I had to reread the last page or two a couple of times to, okay, so what, what, what is she doing? What's happening now? And, um, so and that also kind of works against it. I, I don't dislike the book for these reasons. Um, it is, it's a classic and Stephen King wrote a sequel to The Shining where we find out what happened to Danny Torrance after he grew up. I would love, love a sequel to Firestarter. I would love to know um, what Charlie is, is up to now or what she's been doing in the 
40 plus years since this book came out. But anyway, at number seven, Firestarter. Number six, I have Cujo. I have read Cujo two times in my life. The first time I was a teenager and I was blown away by, it doesn't have any chapter breaks. I mean, just that alone, such a bit simple thing, but it stood out to me as a teenager, just flip flips back and forth between perspectives, between stories, and these, these worlds that he's building, these separate but connected stories, gradually get closer and closer and closer and closer and the tension ratchets up it's masterfully done um i understand it's a book that stephen king doesn't even remember writing which he feels bummed out about because he was in such a um, drug and alcohol fueled haze at the time of its creation but i i think that's amazing um because it's it's a really, really good piece of work. I read it when I was a teenager and I loved it. And I read it in the last couple of years as a father with a son um, the same age as Tad in the novel. And I, it was an exercise in torture, real life, like stomach churning horror because I knew where it was going. I knew what was coming. And, you know, I've, I related more to the adult characters and the parents and Donna and Vic and just trying to do the best and provide for his family and, and keep things together. And I knew where it was going and I was sick to my stomach the entire time, which is not really, doesn't sound like praise, but it, the fact that I stuck with it that it drew me in all over again, I think, speaks to the quality of this book. I didn't enjoy my second read through, but I respected it. I respected what Stephen King accomplished, and I consider it to be top shelf um, classic Stephen King. All right, into the top five. So coming in, at number five, I have Pet Cemetery, the book so scary that it even scared Stephen King. It was so scary, even Stephen King didn't want to publish it. But he did publish it so that he could get a whole ton of money that he was owed and to be released from his contract with Doubleday. And there's a whole, a whole fascinating story behind how this book came to be but um this was one another one i in my epic stephen king reread over the last few years this was one that i hadn't picked up until recently and like with cujo i'm i have a small child and so there was a very real visceral sort of reaction that i felt to the horror and the events of the novel i I think that Stephen King, I've read interviews with him uh, where he talks about Pet Cemetery and didn't particularly enjoy writing it. Um, it he often says that he follows the characters where, wherever they go. Um, like he doesn't, he just, he just writes. He writes what comes into his head and he doesn't actually control the outcome. And this one, I feel like doesn't pull any punches. He sets up a dark scenario and it gets darker and darker and darker and eventually spirals into absolute madness. And it has one of the best, um, most chilling final lines in any Stephen King book. I won't spoil it for you. Um, which is fascinating because I'm the king of spoilers apparently, but if it's on your shelf, if you don't remember, um, read, read the last page because it is, it's dark, but I found the book engaging. I found it gripping. 
um, definitely consider it top shelf Stephen King and I respect how dark it goes how far he takes it um, considering that you know while he is the king of horror his horror is usually leavened by some some sympathetic empathetic um, hopeful element that makes it it in, at some level optimistic and Pet Cemetery is not optimistic it's a very pessimistic book um, maybe one of the most pessimistic books that Stephen King has ever written but it's brilliant so that's number five number four the book that was initially intended to be Richard Bachman's follow-up to Thinner which of course didn't come to pass because the world found out that Stephen King was Richard Bachman. Um, so this book came out under Stephen King's name, and I am talking about Misery. Um, fascinating autobiographical aspects about um, Stephen King's feelings on fame, his relationship, or his sense of connection and relationship with his fans, um, his relationship to drugs and the creative process in general and also how writing can take the author away transport them to a completely different place uh, which i thought was prescient and a little bit of foreshadowing for stephen king's own life when, of course, in the, in the late 90s, he was hit by a van and almost died, but escaped into the writing of Dreamcatcher, um, which he wrote longhand while he was recovering and in excruciating pain and on medication and all of the above. Um, very similar thing happens in Misery. And I think that it's a, a fascinating book about the creative process. It's lean and it's mean, and it def definitely has that sort of Bachman, uh, rainy day pessimism to it, uh, which I really appreciate. Um, it was, it followed up um, in 1987, followed up it, which was uh, Stephen King's longest book to date and comparatively misery. I mean, it just, it really is. It's two people, basically two people in one location and it's lean and it, it, it doesn't have a fat or filler and it cuts to the chase and it is a, a great book. Okay, top three, top three of the eighties. So I kind of gave this one away a little bit earlier when I was talking about The Gunslinger. I mentioned that The Gunslinger is something that I got through looking forward to book two in the series. And I, I have to tell you, I took a break in college after I read The Gunslinger. I just had to take a breather of, I don't know, um, months a year before i moved on to the second book and just like that the second book drew me in um i thought that it was funny i mean there were parts of the book that made me laugh out loud and i thoroughly enjoyed um roland's hopping from his world to our world through portals different time frames all of that um, so coming in at number three, Dark Tower 2, The Drawing of the Three. I'm not going to say that it's the best book in the series. To me, the best book, the one that broke my heart and I read it just the perfect time in my life, is book four, Wizard and Glass. But Drawing of the Three is my favorite Dark Tower book. Um, it's, like I said, it's the place where the entire series kicked into focus for me, um, kicked into high gear. It, I don't know, I sometimes have a hard time getting drawn into alternate realities, 
um, worlds that authors paint that are different than our own. And in that way, uh, Drawing of the Three is almost tailor-made for my own particular taste because a Roland progresses not very far in physical distance in his world and spends the majority of the book in our world drawing his quartet together, the people that join with him on his quest and his epic journey. And um, I just adore the heck out of Drawing of the Three. So this is where, I mean, these lists are incredibly personal and subjective and others may find other books lower on this list to be more definitive, more iconic, but for me, the drawing of the three um, means a heck of a lot to me, and it comes in at number three on my list. So if you've been doing, looking at the list in your head, or looking at a list on Wikipedia, you know that there's only two books left. And so when you find out number two, it's going to give away number one. But at number two, I put um, Stephen King's first collection of novellas, Different Seasons. Um, I love that this book was a change of pace for Stephen King, hence the title, Different Seasons. It was something different that people may not have been expecting from Stephen King, but it showed his breadth as an author. Um, Stephen King, I don't think, has ever considered himself necessarily a horror writer. He writes whatever stories um, come to him, and Different Seasons has four definitive classic Stephen King novellas. Um, Three of them have been made into movies. Two of those movies have been iconic, um, classic movies in their own right. Uh, but the four stories in this book are definitive. If I had to pick a list, and, and I will at some point uh, make a list of like the top five books for people who've never read Stephen King to start with getting into his work, different seasons, um, may end up at the top of that list because the stories are familiar to people from the movies but the books just the book adds so much um i think my favorite of all the stories may actually be the breathing method and which is the one that hasn't been made into a movie and the one that surprised me the most and scared me the most was apt pupil and the body and rita hayworth and shawshank redemption are i mean emotional sentimental nostalgic makes me long for a life that i've that i never led it makes me long for times and places that i will never experience and never see um, it's just top shelf stephen king which brings me to number one, top of my list. It may be a fairly obvious choice, but there's a reason why the choice is almost cliche. Because the book is epic and intimate. It's monstrous and tender. It's brutal and yet somehow gentle and that is Stephen King's epic 1986 opus, years in the making, what Stephen King considered a sort of career summation up to that point, the final word in horror, everything that he had tried to say up to that point, and that is it. Um, epic in length, similar to The Stand, but so much more intimate and I cared, care, I care, um, because, you know, the characters don't just leave your head as soon as you're done with the book. They linger. I care about all the characters in it um, exponentially more than I care about 
characters in the stand. It's not a fair comparison um, other than that the two books are both really, really long, um, but the the world that Stephen King builds, obviously so close to his own heart, so drawn from his own childhood experiences, that personal touch comes through and the losers are heartbreaking and real and I wish that I was a kid and that they were my friends. I wish I was one of them. I wish I'm an adult now. I wish that they were my kids. You know, these are just some of the most iconic characters of any age that Stephen King has ever written. And in terms of villains, man, Pennywise, the interdimensional being made of light from beyond time and space, who most often presents as a clown. Oh, man. Um, I knew about the clown. I knew about the paper boat. Um, I had seen them parts of the miniseries when I was a kid. Um, I think I was seven or eight when the original miniseries was on TV. And like so many people, of around my age, it scared the shit out of me and um, gave me nightmares. And I only watched like bits and pieces. I didn't actually watch the whole thing, which may have actually made it worse. Um, but anyway, just the sheer length of the book um, scared me away for a lot of years. Um, but just in the last five years or so, um, in preparation for the the movies that came out, the recent movies, um, I read the novel and it, it is um, my, one of my favorite top three um, Stephen King novels of all time. And I, I very much admire the, the narratives of set in the past, set at the present, and the way the two stories sort of complement each other and it, it shows the you know the cyclical nature of the story and they they come back as adults and they, they do it all again but um, unlike the movies which you know one movie takes place in the past one movie takes place in the present so you know if they were only gonna make one movie they went with the the older story that features the kids which I think was the right move but they see it through from beginning to end and it makes the second movie, I don't know, it, it has to try a little bit harder because it has to overcome that sense of, haven't we done this before? Um, but the novel, the way it's structured is brilliant and both narratives are sort of going simultaneously. They complement each other, they foreshadow each other and they hold um, the secrets and the rewards and the payoff until the end and I was exhilarated um, by the end of the novel I was exhausted by the end of the novel and I was just absolutely floored um, so there's a handful of Stephen King novels and books where you know probably a dozen if he had only written like a dozen particular books he would still be um, one of the most famous and beloved authors of the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, and it is definitely one of those sort of tentpole releases and looms very large in the Stephen King universe. And, you know, it's hard to pick, it's hard to pick a number one. Uh, eventually I will do all of Stephen King's books. I will rate them all but even in the very fertile period of the 1980s and how prolific Stephen King was to me it stands um, head and shoulders above the rest of the pack so there you have it that's my um, ranking the 1980s and I'd love to know what you think um, leave any comments, feedback, tell me that I'm crazy, tell me what your number one book of the 80s is, um, tell me which one that ended up, oh, was at the bottom of the list that 
you were like, hell no, that should be way up at the top. I want to know those things. So feel free to comment. Um, let me know what you think. And I hope that this has been entertaining. I hope that this has inspired you to create your own list. And, um, and I hope that you have a brilliant rest of your day. Thanks a lot. Bye.